Well, good morning once again. Um, as we head into this sermon time, we are once again in the midst of a series we're calling Holy Threads, just about these major themes that run all the way through the scriptures. And uh, as we build into the uh, further and further into the Advent season and anticipate this celebration of the incarnation of the coming of Christ, um, there are all sorts of themes that are Holy Threads. And today's is all about the coming Messiah. Um, before we get into that, I just want to remind us for a second of some of the threads that we've looked at because there will be an echo of some of these threads in the text that we look at today. Not only the high, whole idea of a new creation, which is manifest in the city of God, but also this shepherd who comes, who brings light, um, who also is going to be married to his people and is also a symbol, a, a fulfillment of God's covenants, God's promises upon us. And so as we look into these passages, it's a bunch of classic Christmas texts from the sort of gospel according to Isaiah. That is uh, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a, yeah, I'll get into Isaiah in a moment. Um, First, let's pray and then let's read these texts. Lord, we trust that you are indeed altogether good. We trust that you're present with us in this space. And as we open up your word, we pray that you would be, oh man, holy and fully present to us. Um, and that regardless of what words I speak today, may your words penetrate deep into all of our being and everyone who is present here or present online, may your word go out. We know it does not return to you void. May it be so. And all your people say, amen, which is a line from Isaiah. It doesn't return to him void. So a couple passages from Isaiah, starting with Isaiah chapter two. This is what Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And then a few chapters later in Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, and chapter eight talks about this darkness. Nevertheless, starting in chapter nine, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were once, who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then turning over to Isaiah chapter 11. 
A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea." In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. And then moving forward a number of chapters to Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, on this servant, this predicted king. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards and you will be called priests of the Lord and you will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of the nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so will you, inherit, you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and, out, and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seed to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before the nations. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. So thanks for sticking with me through Isaiah. One of the themes of Isaiah, as you may have figured out, is this future hope of an anticipated king. Future hope of an anticipated king. So if you ever pick up up the book of Isaiah, this is one of the major themes that you can trust that you will encounter. The future hope of an anticipated king. In other words, Isaiah kind of has its own sub-thread amidst the big holy threads. And it is a holy thread that goes well beyond Isaiah and bleeds right into the New Testament, right? If this is one of the major themes of Isaiah, it is also um, one of the sort of the backbone to the gospels themselves, because of course the anticipated king is Christ Jesus. It's Christ Jesus. That it's one of the main themes is anticipation of a 
Messiah. And in fact, you know, as you can imagine, there's all sorts of Old Testament texts that build toward the New Testament, and the New Testament makes references to those Old Testament texts. And of all the texts that it makes reference to, it quotes no Old Testament books more than Psalms and Isaiah. Isaiah, including some of the texts that we just read. All because one of the major themes is the theme of this anticipation of a Messiah. A Messiah, which comes from this Hebrew word. Hebrew word, mashach. Mashach. Which means to anoint. Uh, It's related to the word for oil. It's from which we get the Hebrew, I mean, our word, Messiah. It's sort of the transliterated word. But in biblical times, anointing somebody with oil, something we tend not to do anymore, but back then, anointing somebody with oil was a sign that God was consecrating them or setting them apart for some sort of special role or purpose, some sort of God-ordained purpose. And so in the Old Testament, um, people were anointed specifically for the roles of uh, prophet, priest, and king. So Elijah anointed Elisha with oil to mark him off as a prophet of the Lord. And in a similar way, Aaron was anointed as the first high priest of Israel with this oil. And Samuel anointed both Saul and David to be kings to be set apart, consecrated with that oil. So Elisha and Aaron and Samuel, they were all anointed to different positions. And yet, um, Isaiah and other parts of the Old Testament, but we're looking at Isaiah today, predict this coming deliverer, a chosen one, an anointed one, who's been anointed by God to do all those things, to be prophet, priest, king, and ultimately redeemer and savior. And thus, we have this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. This is coming from the voice of that anointed one. And there is that word, that word that gets played out as Messiah. Um, There's another passage that we didn't read from Isaiah 42 that lays it out kind of plainly. Here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. There is this expectation for a Messiah. And if you didn't know it, the Greek equivalent is the word Christos. And thus, when we even say Jesus Christ, we're talking about the same thing. In the Greek, that krio, that little prefix of the Christos, krio, means anoint. It's the same thing. So the Hebrew anticipation of a Messiah is why we call him Jesus Christ. That's not his last name. It could just as easily be Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the anointed one. He is the one who fulfills all these prophecies. So that's kind of starting at the end. Let's go back and trace back through this thread and pick up some of the things that Isaiah is saying along the way. Um, So first of all, you need to know a little bit of the context for Isaiah, that when Isaiah comes on the, on the scene, he's very concerned about his people. He's seen their division into two people, this northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, which is really hard to read in the Old Testament if you because you think, oh, is it talking about these people, Israel, or what? What's, it gets kind of confusing. But there's these two kingdoms. He's seen it. He's seen the downfall of the northern kingdom, and he feels the downfall of the southern kingdom is coming. And that's where he's a part of, the southern kingdom. That includes Judah and Jerusalem. So you can see that in Isaiah chapter 2, the verse, very first thing. It's addressed to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. It's addressed to these people. And he himself is within that context, and he's feeling the darkness. And we... Part of what we're doing when we come into this Advent season is we can either kind of manufacture the darkness or, hey, we can just look around us and see that the world is full of all sorts of darkness. And so we can relate to Isaiah. This is part of what he saw as the darkness. He saw the division of his people. He saw something was going to happen. 
and he assumes, um, before he even speaks, a whole body of knowledge, which if you've been with us all through the fall, then you have that body of knowledge. And of course, if you've grown up in the church and read your Bible, you have this body of knowledge. Um, the whole history of this holy thread, right? Of all these holy threads that fit into God's story. But the, but the primary thing about that body of knowledge is something that we covered two weeks ago. And that's about God's covenants. God's covenants. Um, that Isaiah is deeply aware of what we're aware of. That these covenants, the promises, first of all, come through Abraham, that God promised to make him a large nation uh, that would mediate divine blessing to all the nations. That's the, even the name Abraham means father of many nations. And that that promise then got developed as Abraham's family grew, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob even as they ended up in slavery, but they're rescued and brought out of slavery. And then a new covenant, uh, a, like a, uh, not, not necessarily new, but a reissuing of the covenant comes through Moses. And that's what we find in Exodus chapter 19, all the way through chapter 24. And they're supposed to um, obey a lot of these commands that God has given and be priestly representatives to all these nations that they're supposed to bless. However, as the story goes on, the family of Abraham fails at that task and so God raises up this new leader, David, and it's uh, a royal leader, leader who would be faithful on behalf of God, a, a faithful people. But even he is unfaithful uh, and has all sorts of failures. Just go back and read his story, some pretty profound failures. But it's promised that one of his descendants will help bring about all that God has promised. That's part of what we explored in 2 Samuel chapter Seven, where God promised that a faithful king would arise and lead God's people toward faithfulness. And this king would rule over the nations, be a blessing to all the nations, as Abraham said, um, forever and ever. And David himself was not that king, nor was his son, nor apparently were any of his descendants up to that point. And so when we open up the book of Isaiah... We're anticipating this promised king, and it doesn't look like this king is coming. It looks like things are in disarray. But he is picking up that line. And one of the main themes of the book is this future hope of this anticipated king. And so what does that look like? Well, it starts right at the beginning. He paints this picture of desperation, so those two kingdoms, but also that the true kingdom of God is coming, and when it does, it will result in this that he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Almost the exact opposite of what's currently happening in the Middle East. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So yes, there's all this darkness coming, so... Oh, let us walk in the light of this one who wants to take all the swords and beat them into plowshares and spears and turning them into pruning hooks. The one who wants to bring about peace among the nations, that when the true kingdom comes, that will be what happens. And the rest of the book of Isaiah picks up on and develops this storyline, the restoration because of a new king resulting in peace on earth, which is why some people call it the peaceable kingdom the peaceful kingdom. And in the readings we had today, we skipped from Isaiah chapter two to Isaiah chapter nine, but part of what we've got in between that is an example of an unfaithful king, uh, Ahaz, and, and we'll get into that next week because the promise of Emmanuel comes in the face of him being unfaithful, but we'll get into that. Um, but once again, there's Isaiah looking for a king to be the ultimate fulfillment of David's promises and although, as he describes in chapter 8, there is darkness in the land, a light is coming. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. 
you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. It's such an interesting passage. It's this prophecy of what will be, but it's spoken in the past tense so that we can almost like put our feet into that new space and look around at it and see what it consists of. That when Jesus comes, when his fullness, they will rejoice before you as people before the harvest. There's warriors rejoice when dividing plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. So people that uh, maybe are feeling oppression and feeling things coming down upon them will step into this new land and feel the burden. The yoke has been taken off. This is part of the reason why Jesus says, my yoke is easy. The rod of their oppressor will come off. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fueled for fire. So all that old warrior stuff and all the, and, and primarily it's saying this because the, the people who had warred against God's people, they had felt the, the, the wrath of all of it. So man, May it all just be burned up in fire so that this new thing can come. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will rest on his shoulders. So when his, his authority comes, ooh, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All those names make this declaration about the type of God God is. Um, that he's a mighty God, and that word mighty there really conveys this idea of a warrior God. That, hey, if there's warriors out there in the world, God is this warrior God who is also an extraordinary counselor. And the word counselor there is all about planning. It's all about um, having a plan. So, so Yahweh is an expert at determining what the future should bring and seeing that it does so. And he's capable of that because he's so mighty. He's capable of making plans that will bring about events that no one could have guessed. That's part of what's being put here. That even as you step into this new reality, out of this darkness into the light, it's going to have parts of it that you cannot even imagine. Because the everlasting father also has this royal authority to bring peace, which is this Hebrew word shalom, which consists of much more than, but also includes peace without war, but also just this general well-being. So no longer under that oppression, but also well-being for all people. So yeah, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, will accomplish this. So needless to say, this is a pretty famous poem for good reason that people in all times and places have looked, please bring this kind of kingdom. Please exercise your authority as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And we got just a glimpse of it in Christ walking on the earth 2000 years ago and the way everywhere he went, this was the kind of thing. He said to Peter, put down your sword. And he brought forth that yoke that is easy. And then we want, oh, not just that first coming, but the second coming. We want it in all of its fullness. That despite what we have done to bring darkness on the land, bring your light, bring everything that that's about. And that's what I say is desiring, um, not only in that first coming, but in its ultimate fulfillment, um, which gets echoed again in Isaiah chapter 11, um, which you will notice includes not just that God's bringing it about peace, but the recreation, the renewal of creation itself, um, resetting of God's ultimate design. So this is what it says. A stump will come up from the stump of Jesse. So Jesse uh, is the direct line of David. So in the line of David. And from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. He will be endowed with this sevenfold spirit. Spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding of counsel, that ability to plan and foresee and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So somehow the, the son is in awe of the father, um, just in fear of everything. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes and decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will get to give decisions for the poor of the earth. All that to say that um, he's concerned about all those that we so easily forget. 
even when we're caught up with Ukraine or the Middle East, that there's 1.5 million people displaced in the Sudan and the Lord has not forgotten about them. He will judge for the needy. You know, with justice, he will make decisions for the poor of the earth. So the call of this coming of this coming king is this huge call for the rest of us to participate in the redemption of all things. To participate in something that's much bigger than usually the little view of Christmas that we've got. Um, And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. That, oh man, we just all hope that the people who are really messing the world up right now will be brought to justice. Righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness will be the sash around his waist. So he's concerned not just that we receive the Messiah, but that we live in allegiance to God's purposes. He's about righteousness. And that we ourselves, if we accept this Messiah as Savior, also need to accept this Messiah as Lord. That is, not just the one who saves us, but the one who is then in charge. The one whom we then obey. He's about that righteousness, about being faithful to God. And then listen to this, the, this giant purpose. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw instead of the ox. The infant will play near a cobra's den. It's hard to even imagine. A young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. So instead of us yanking that child out of there, we'll say, go ahead, pet that viper. They will neither harm or destroy on all my holy mountain for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That if the earth was actually filled with the knowledge of the Lord, it would look like some of that. It would look like some of that. And this is part of the reason that the theme for Advent is, for today is joy. It's about joyful anticipation of all that the Messiah's kingdom entails. All of it. All of it. So the last part, right? The spirit of the, so yeah, there's this, all sorts of statements, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, that talk about the fullness of this kingdom and this servant who's going to bring it about, this righteous king. There's some intervening. So we jumped all the way to 61. There's some other ones intervening. You look at Isaiah 42, look at Isaiah 49, look at Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant. And there's this one in Isaiah chapter 61 that brings a bunch of these themes together. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. So this is Jesus quotes this in Luke chapter four to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And then once they've received all that, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore the places long devastated. They will renew the renewed ruined cities they will, they, that have been devastated for generations. So in some ways, this is partly a, a picture of the kingdom when it has fully come that all this mourning will be replaced with oil and gladness and that then all these things will be restored. There will be righteousness. There will be a planting. There will be like a new garden and they will rebuild the ancient ruins. There will be a new city. It points toward both pieces of that in Revelation and gives us basically a commission in the here and now to be those people that live into, that receive this Messiah, that receive this Messiah, that proclaim the good news about this Messiah, Messiah, and then live into the good news of this Messiah and be about those people, be about this big picture. This picture is insanely big. That's why I think the biggest question coming right now is, is your Messiah big enough? 
that when it comes to this theme in the scriptures that we see that we encounter every single Christmas, that there's a coming Messiah who came 2,000 years ago and is going to come again. And these pictures here paint such a giant picture of what the fullness of his kingdom will be like. We can hardly even imagine stepping into the fullness of it. But that one of the challenges for us this morning is to try, try by the Spirit's help to imagine a kingdom that's big enough. That you can't read Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 61 and think that this Messiah is just for the sake of personal salvation. For sure, he's your Savior, my Savior, each one of our Savior. But he's also seeking the redemption of all things. He's seeking to bring light to every dark place. He's seeking to bring an easy yoke to everything that feels like a yoke of oppression. Seeking to right all the wrongs and take down all those that are creating evil in the world and exalt those who are humble in the world. Seeking to bring about justice and righteousness. He's bringing a kingdom in which there is the renewal of all things. So it's not just the celebration of a coming Messiah. It's an anticipation of the renewal of all things. And a desire for us to participate in it. And not wait. We have a really good friend um, who sends out a, um, a prayer letter every week. Things he's thanking God for and things that he's asking other people to pray for. He leads a ministry down in Lafayette, Indiana, where we're from. And he often includes a quote. And his quote from this past week just felt so pertinent to me. It's from somebody named James Clear, who I know nothing about. But this is what the quote says. Stop acting like there is infinite time. This, the way you are living right now, is your one life. Stop acting like there is infinite time. This, the way you are living right now, is your one life. I think sometimes we're um, kind of like in when we're waiting in Advent, we're waiting for this coming Messiah and waiting for our eternal salvation and waiting for a lot of things to happen. And there is an anticipatory waiting that involves moving. It involves bringing light to some dark places. It involves being an advocate for the renewal of all things. It, call, it involves celebrating and proclaiming the message of the Messiah here, near, and far. And so, yeah, the question is, is our Messiah big enough? Can we make room for this Messiah and then live like it? Um, Let's pray for the Holy Spirit's help. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you, ugh, help us. Help us, help us, help us. For those that um, are in this space or at home that don't fully know you and have not received you as Messiah, may their Messiah grow and be bigger in their heads and hearts today that you would enter into them that they would hear you knocking at their door and the door of their heart and open up their heart to you. And for all of us who have been walking with you for a while, may we be opened up to the fullness of your kingdom in such a way that we are people who live out these words of Isaiah 2 and 9 and 11 and 61 and much more. Thank you for this powerful vision Give us the capacity to see the bigness of it and participate to the extent that we can. Help us, Holy Spirit. Give us not only uh, some direction, but also the courage to step forth in that direction. May it be so. And all your people say, Amen.